Okay, folks, so this is uh, meant to be a tutorial for you to support your understanding of how Germany unified and on the larger question of how nationalism played out in the German states. And I wanted to start off with this political cartoon of Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, who you'll remember is the Chancellor of Germany, or Prussia, I'm sorry, um, one of the largest German states. And this is in a French newspaper at a time when Germany was about to go to war with France. Uh, and he's labeled here the big German ogre. Uh, and so if you look at him here, he's gobbling up the the European forces and little men. And he's just, he's, he's a horrible creature. And so I want you to think throughout this, like, you know, why would they consider Bismarck an ogre? And was he an ogre uh, or was he uh, an ardent genius politician? Uh, he's known uh, for being real politique, for practicing real politique, which, as you'll see, um, could be perceived as being an ogre, or it could just be really smart, and the nationalists should be supportive of that. Let's take a look. So Bismarck said things like, for the state, in contrast to the individual, self-preservation is the supreme law. The state must survive at any price. It cannot go into the poorhouse. It cannot beg. It cannot commit suicide. In short, it must take wherever it can find the essentials of life. This, in essence, is real polity. The, the state, the organization that is running the state, must survive at any price. Whether it's doing things that seem wrong or right, it doesn't really matter. It's about self-preservation, survival. He also said that in regards to the German states that surround him, and remember that there's Prussia and 39 other different little states that are ruled by princes and kings or different leaders, um, and they all speak German and have a similar culture. Um, and Prussia was hoping to unify all of them around it and call it Germany. Um, and Bismarck said, look, the German states don't look to us for their liberalism, but to her power. The great questions of the day are not to be decided by speeches and majority resolutions, but by blood and iron, by war, by power. And this is sort of similar to how Cavour saw Sardinia's role in Italy's unification. going to take a look. It's been a combination of nationalism and it's going to be this real politique, doing whatever is necessary for the survival of the, in this case, Prussian state. So let's take a look. Like Italy, there's some obstacles to unity. For Germany, uh, there was a lot of political and social bitterness. A lot of the different little principalities and different states of the Germanic states, the old Holy Roman Empire, had a lot of bitterness. A lot of them, just because they spoke German, didn't automatically see themselves as being unified together because there was, they were bitter. What were they bitter about? A couple of things. Um, during the Protestant Reformation, what you have is essentially a protest against the Catholic Church. You have the Catholic Church dominating all of Europe in the 1400s and the 1500s, and there is this, this protest, this Protestant movement to challenge the Catholic Church, and this pitted some German states against the others. Some went Protestant, some went Catholic, uh, and they fought uh, really bloody, devastating wars against each other in this uh, this reformation between Protestants and Catholics. This gets kind of wrapped up a little bit later with the Thirty Years' War, in which various parts of Germany are fighting each other, and so it's not natural that they should get along really easily. We have, in addition to political un disunity from before, we also have the fact that these little tiny states, and you can see some of these on, on the map there, they're tiny, they fear a unification because they're afraid that Prussia, the big yellow power there, will dominate them. And so they hesitate. Austria, which is the kind of gray, brown, tan area towards the bottom of the little uh, red circle there, they're fearful of Prussians' dominance and economic competition. So they find every way to avoid unification as well because they feel that if Germany unifies, they'll be excluded and Prussia will run the show. Not too far off from what actually happens. Now, let's talk about Prussia for a minute. Prussia is this blue area, uh, and they're the strongest economy in the German states. It's where Berlin is. We think of Germany today, Berlin. Uh, it is the largest of the states. It's very well organized. They have a steep, they're steeped in military tradition, um, and there's a lot of power in Prussia. Um, now, like Europe, there's this liberal movement. Now, Prussia is a monarchy led by a person, a king called the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm I. And the liberal nationalists want to create a unified Germany, but they want to do so under a republic or a more democratic form of government that we're seeing in a lot of the other countries around this time in the 1800s. Um, and their hope is to introduce democracy to gain support. And all the other little states will say, yes, look how awesome and, and progressive and liberal uh, Prussia is. It, it makes sense to join them. Um, these guys tend to be wary of the army because remember, liberals who challenge the monarchy in the 1800s are often crushed by the army. So they're very wary and, and nervous about the army. 
contrast pretty dramatically with Bismarck. Bismarck is the chancellor of Prussia. He works for the Kaiser. He's like the second in command, kind of like a prime minister. And he is of the aristocratic uh, Junker class. And Bismarck is all about real politics, right? What is this? It's the state must do whatever is necessary to maintain power. So what are we going to see here? Um, he wants to raise money for the expansion of the military. And he's like, we can unify the German states under Prussia, but we got to do it with the big military. So what he does is, is he makes this proposal. But uh, the Liberal Finance Committee rejects expanding taxes to expand the military. So being the real politic guy that he is, he sidesteps the uh, Finance Committee and with the support of the Kaiser, collects taxes without authorization and he gets away with it. And what he does is, is he wants to use this military to reduce Austrian, its biggest rival, Austrian influence in the German states. How do we knock down Austria? We concoct some wars to get rid of them and we need to have a big military too. So his idea was, let's put all the German states under Prussian control, we'll call it Germany, and Prussia will just be a state in Germany, and Austria will be on the outside trying. He does this by starting and instigating three wars for unification. Uh, <clears throat> and this is pretty. This is real, very real politique, because these wars are essentially all things he concocts. He doesn't need to go to war. It wasn't like they were threatened. He uses these wars to unify these German states. And the first war is the war against Denmark. And if you look up in the, the top of the map, the north of the map, <clears throat> you'll see Denmark. <clears throat> and if you look just under Denmark, you'll see the Schleswig and the Holstein. These were two areas that Denmark was controlling. Um, and he wanted to, Bismarck wanted to bring them more directly into the control of Prussia. And so he, he basically says, oh, there, there are people in the Schleswig and Holstein who are Germans longing to be free and united with their fellow Germans. And he paints the, the king of Denmark as his oppressor. And he says, hey, uh, Austria, <clears throat> let's work together to uh, free these German peoples. We're both German-speaking peoples. Let's go unite them, or, or free them, I'm sorry, and unite them with us. And they do, and they jointly, they easily win this war, and they jointly, Austria and Prussia, jointly run the Schleswig and the Holstein. But if you look at their internal notes right after this war, uh, Bismarck says to one of his ministers, because the policy of the Congress of Vienna, Germany, the Germanic states, are clearly too small for both Prussia and Austria. As long as an honorable arrangement concerning the influence of each in Germany cannot be concluded and carried out, we will both plow the same disputed acre. And Austria will remain the only state to whom we can permanently lose, from whom we can permanently gain. I wish to only express my conviction that in the not too distant future, we shall have to fight for our existence against Austria, and that it's not within our power to avoid that, since the course of events in Germany has no other solution. Austria is the only one who we can gain or lose from. we got to knock him out. So what he does is he finds an excuse to go to war with Austria. And so he, before he does this, <clears throat> he isolates Austria. He goes to Russia and says, hey, Russia, if I get involved in a war with Austria, uh, will you promise to back me up? And if you back me up, we'll make sure you get, uh, we'll help you crush the Poles. The Poles, the Polish people are trying to get their own country. And, and he goes to France and he says, France, if you back me up against Austria, we'll help you out. And he goes to all these different um, people, including Cavour and Sardinia, by the way, and the Italians. And they say, hey, look, if you stay out of our war with Austria or, or help us out, uh, we'll give you a little province of Venetia that you want in Venice. And so he isolates. It's almost like he's talking trash behind Austria's back and gets everyone to be ready to pounce on Austria finds a reason. They basically dispute how they're running the Schleswig and the Holstein, and he uses that as an excuse. And in the Seven Weeks War, uh, Prussia goes to war with Austria, and he takes the part of the Schleswig, the part that Austria was controlling, uh, and what he does is, is he knocks down Austria. <clears throat> but it's interesting. He doesn't punish Austria too much. He says, um, look, at the war of Austria, this is, again, uh, one of the field marshals of the Prussians, the war between Prussia and Austria was entered on not because the existence of Prussia was threatened, nor was it caused by public opinion and the voice of the people. It was a struggle long foreseen and calmly prepared for, recognized as a necessity by the cabinet, not for territorial aggrandizement. We're not trying to get more land. For an extension of our domain, we're not trying to like take anything or material advantage, but for an ideal end, the goal, the establishment of power. Not a foot of land was taken from Austria. She had to renounce all part in her hegemony or influence of Germany. This is just to, just to slap Austria down and say, look, at you don't run the German states and don't forget it. And what he does is, is uh, Prussia and, and Bismarck, they just take all that kind of, if you look at the map, they kind of yellowy, orangey areas, and they unite that into the Northern German Confederacy, and they exclude Austria, all right? And they don't punish them. Right? If Bismarck says, look, we had to avoid wounding Austria too severely. We had to avoid leaving behind in her any unnecessary bitterness of feeling or desire for revenge. We ought to, you know, reserve the possibility of becoming friends again with our enemy at the moment. 
In any case, regard the Austrian state as a piece on the European chessboard. You know, if we punish Austria too much, if we enter her too much, she might team up with France or some other opponent of ours. So this is very real politic. We're going to go to war with them. We're going to remind them that we are in charge of the German states. We're going to form this confederacy in the north, but they're not going to be part of it. But we're not going to hurt her. And we're not going to make her pay for anything because we don't want to make them too bitter. Um, and why don't we want to take them, get them too bitter? Because we're going to take another war. And this is the Frank Old Prussian War. And uh, this is the French versus the Prussians. And if you look at this, Bismarck says, look, I always considered that a war with France would naturally follow a war against Austria. I was convinced that the gulf which was created over time between the north and the south of Germany could not become over, better overcome than by a national war. I did not doubt that it was necessary to make a, to make a French-German war before the general reorganization of Germany could be realized. What he's saying is, look, the people in that little lavender purple area, Strasbourg down there in Munich, they have no love for, for Prussia or Berlin. The way we need to make them, hide them closer to us is to make them hate and fear the French, and then they'll want to be with their fellow Germans. And so what he does is he, he concocts a war with France. Uh, there was a minor little dispute uh, that France and, and Prussia were trying to negotiate. It was some royal family issue in Spain. And what ends up happening is they have a pretty peaceful meeting. Uh, and the Kaiser gives a note, a telegram to Bismarck and say, hey, give this to the French diplomat and we will, you know, we'll, we'll work something out. Bismarck, behind the Kaiser's back, rewrites it to be extremely insulting to the French. Like, Get the heck out of here. We're not going to talk to you. Sends it to the French diplomat and mails it to the French newspaper. And all the French are enraged and ready to go to war with uh, Prussia. And the Prussians and the Germans can't understand why the French are so angry. And pretty soon there's a war between the French and the Prussians. This is exactly what uh, Bismarck wanted, because what it would do is it would make the people in the lavender area down there in Baden and Hesse and the Alsace and Lorraine, they would be all, all scared of the French now, and they would look to Prussia for protection. And the Franco-Prussian War, it's a pretty quick war. Uh, the Prussians invade France, take Paris. And uh, they take a whole bunch of land that was part of French that they claim have Germans in it, the Alsace and Lorraine, and they unite all of Germany under one big uh, country now. And you have these different little states, and Prussia is the most dominant one, but now there's the German Empire. And they think about this, what is this going to do to the balance of power of Europe? It's radically going to shift the power, balance of power. And Metternich was worried about this kind of thing. And lo and behold, most historians argue that this essentially leads to World War One. We'll get there later. If you just let's reflect for a minute, friends and foes, if you look at it, right, during the wars to unify, Prussia forms alliances with Austria, Russia, France, and Italy, right? Now, what's ironic about him teaming up with these countries? In almost every case, he goes to war with them again, right? <clears throat> um, this is an example of real politique. Why? Because it doesn't really matter whether he's friendly or not with them. In fact, is at certain points, he needs certain allies, and at other points, he needs to knock them down a notch, and he does. Now, once... Germany is united. Uh, the Kaiser Wilhelm I, who was the Prussian Kaiser or ruler, now becomes the German Kaiser. Um, so, you know, when you think, what state was he before uh, assuming the throne of Germany? He was the Kaiser of Prussia. What does it say about the new German government? It's very Prussia dominated. All right. So Kaiser is now the German Kaiser. And Bismarck is now the German Chancellor, not just the Prussian Chancellor. <clears throat> In the United Germany, you have the Democrats, those Republicans, people who are fighting for a, a more democratic form of government. They're frustrated because instead of having a liberal democracy that they were hoping for in 1848, what they get is an aristocratic uh, country dominated by the wealthy Juncker class. It is a, a very conservative monarchy uh, led by the aristocrats and it's more and more so the wealthy industrialists. And so while they're united, they're a bit frustrated because democracy is still very much lacking and won't actually come to Germany until during World War I towards the end. They have a revolt uh, and they create a republic in 1918. Um, but that comes later. On your sheet, essentially, uh, how is uh, Bismarck's use of real politik played out in Europe? Uh, were the German people taken advantage of? Should the German nationalists be happy? Or should they thank him? Uh, should Bismarck be remembered as an ogre? Should he be considered like an awesome hero or or more of the father of Na or, or an ogre? Sorry. Uh, and is Bismarck moral, meaning he's guided by a sense of right and wrong, immoral, meaning he's guided by a sense of like evil, horrible uh, judgments, or amoral, doesn't act with any kind of moral judgment at all? So what do you think? Write it down. We'll talk about it tomorrow.